I'm calling to order the uh, Hingham Board of Selectmen meeting for April 3rd, 2018. Our colleague and chair, Mary Power, will be joining us shortly. Uh, and until that time, we're going to proceed in accordance with the agenda. And the first item on the agenda is the minutes of March 27th, 2018. Uh, let me just look through and make sure we got them all here. Okay, yeah, that looks right. Council? I'd like to move that we approve the minutes dated March 27, 2018. I'll second that. Is there a discussion? I'm seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Public comment. Hearing none, we'll proceed to the first item. And that is a public hearing on the request of National Grid to install and maintain approximately 470 feet of two inch gas main in Beale Street. I see the gas company here. I see the highway here. Greetings, salutations. Would National Grid take us through what they propose okay. to do? Uh, the National Grid hereby respectfully <coughs> requests your consent to install and maintain approximately 470 feet, more or less, of two inch gas main in Beale Street, Hingham, from the existing two inch gas main at 85 Beale Street westerly to the end of the main near house number 21 weather main court in order to provide, provide a gas service to number 100 Beale Street. Okay. Um, <coughs> what's the age of the existing gas line? Uh, do you have any idea of what that is? Um, well, they don't give the age. I believe the existing gas line was put in in the 80s. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure of that. There's going to be an extension of that gas line. To, for, uh, so service. this is an extension and not a replacement? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Seeing it's plastic, it's, um, it is definitely, see the, seeing that it's plastic, it is n newer. It's a newer gas main. Okay. And um, is this also going to tie into Squirrel Hill Lane? Uh, it is not. It is not going into Squirrel Hill. Um, Harry, do we have any ledge in that area? Uh, I wouldn't think so. They'll only be going down maybe four plus feet, and I don't think they'll be hitting any rock in that area. Um, I know that's kind of a low spot in terms of the street with Baker Hill uh, alongside of it. Are, are there any kind of flooding issues that we got to be concerned about here? Uh, we shouldn't. I mean, it'll be above the culvert that goes, you know, adjacent to uh, Squirrel Hill Lane, but. Um, They'll be digging test holes like they normally do before they start a project to make sure there's uh, any obstructions as uh, they put that gas main in. How long do you estimate this is going to take? Yeah, it shouldn't take more than a week once they get started. Is this going to um, interfere or in any way slow down the progress on the Main Street project? No, it won't. It'll be a totally separate crew. Okay. Who's doing it? Riley. I'm not sure. But I'm it could be Riley. Yeah. yeah, Riley Brothers Construction, I would believe. But okay. All right. Um, what's the age of the street in terms of its? Of I believe schedule? it's seven years old, possibly eight. Are, are we looking at re uh, repaving at some point? I know you are grinding in late final uh, trench repair. I mean, they mill it down an inch and a half, and then. You know, um, put the inch and a half back on, grade. Okay. So it's not on the schedule anytime soon? No, it isn't. Okay. Are there any other subsurface utilities that are implicated by this work? Uh, there shouldn't be, but, I mean, that road has a full, uh, you know, group of utilities in there. There's water. There's another gas main in there. It's drainage, sewer. So, um, you know. There's parallel gas mains here? Yeah, there's a high-pressure gas main that uh, comes down 
ends up going through the square and ends up going out to the rotary. That was put in, in I'm sure that was put in, I think it was uh, 86. Where is that in relation to this work? It, uh, I think that's on the other side of the road. It is right. right it is, yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's pretty much on the other side of the road. Um, it is the solid line. Yes. Uh, yep. The one we want oh, to put okay. on is the dotted and then the solid line okay. below it. Yep, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's no proposed work being done on that? No. It looks like you have, there's a tie-in of some sort to some to existing building marked 100? To 100, that, that's what the whole project is for, to provide gas service to that, um, that home. And have all the abutters been notified of the opportunity to tie in? They've been notified. Do they get the opportunity to tie in? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the, we haven't discussed this at length because it hasn't been approved yet. It, assuming the approval, and I see no reason not to, but um, do, do the abutters get the opportunity to tie in before the work starts so we don't have to cut the street open again? Um, well, it's, it depends, you know, on... Uh, you know, finances would have to be paid for by the individual homeowners, so, you know, that sometimes doesn't go as quickly as this work may be taken, but it would just be an added uh, lateral trench to the uh, main itself, if that was the case. Does the company pay to the edge of the right-of-way? Um, right now, there is a deal, I believe, going on by the gas well, company. It's free to, to hook up onto the gas main, but I believe the, the cost of the, um, the main extension is on the homeowner. Yeah, the, the main extension is on the homeowner. That's DEP regulations, uh, DPU regulations. And, um, but the service line to, from the main to the meter is uh, at the charge of the gas company. I don't really like to give that information out because everyone starts thinking, gee, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, not yeah, a bad yeah. deal. Let's start cutting <laughs> yeah. the roads. But, yeah, that's, that's the case, uh, at least for this year. Okay. Do you have any questions, Karen? Yeah, you, you asked most all of them, with the exception of, again, just, uh, you know, looking at the map, I'm just, I just want to be sure that if there is anybody in that vicinity that would like to tie in as part of the project, that they're, that they're right. afforded that well, opportunity. If, if I was the homeowner and I was going to extend fi 500 feet, almost 500, I would certainly uh, try to get some other try, folks, yeah. right? Get yeah. on board, yeah, to yeah. make it a, a less cost, you know, I mean, costly for me. Right, there, right, absolutely. So, there's the cost yeah. element, but there's also the disruption to Beale Street, which That's is, correct, you know, yeah. a commuter way. Yeah. And uh, Which I'm not sure. They probably would draw in the houses. There may not be houses in that area, like a lot. There are a lot on the 100 side. In fact, I believe the... Uh, that little subdivision, I think it's around number 80. Further up, that's right. Yeah, they, they were all hooked up with gas when that went in. And how about Weather Van Court? Do they have gas? Yeah, and that comes, yeah, yes. And they they come do. Back, yeah. There's they a do. gas man that comes okay. down from like Fortler Road okay. that services all those. Okay. The reason why this area didn't have a gas main was connected, I believe, via the railroad tracks. Yeah. At one time went through there. Yeah. So now that they're gone and uh, the, uh, the resident, I think it's a group residence, uh, you know, decided to go to grass, and that's why they're extending it to that one building. Oh, okay. Okay. Is this work going to be done at night? No. At least at this time, it's not planned at night. All right. Oh, and I, I'm sorry. When are you anticipating starting the work? Um, as soon as the, um, the permit can be obtained, and that would be immediately. Or? Yeah, as soon as the permit's uh, applied for, I'll be talking to the, the supervisors that are in charge of this work, and then we'll get a schedule down. Probably, I would say within the you know next month. Um, they're actively working on Stanford Drive now, which is a gas main that we're hoping will get on the ground sooner than later. There's been a little bit of delay up there because for some reason the gas main's been down six feet and deeper in spots, and that's n not normal. Okay. I think when the subdivision was, you know, laid out, um, there were some grade changes after they put the utilities in, so they've raised it, and now they're deeper than normal, so they're going a little slower up there than anticipated. I have no further questions. <clears throat> Why am I not surprised at that one? Um, okay. Any questions from the audience? Anybody like to comment? Yes, sir. Please identify yourself for the record. Yeah, I just one. Mark Tedeschi from 85 Beale Street. Um, is there a disruption of service if this goes through, and then you said it was about a week to get through? Yeah, there will be no disruption for your service, no. There would. 
Are you a, a gas customer now? Yes. And you're so you're already on the existing one anyway. Right. So no, I would say no. Okay. And the process about a week. Is that the timeline? That's yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Anybody else? I just want to clarify that it will be probably a week to install, and then we'll come back through the final trench patching sometime later on in the summer. So that'll probably be about a month or two out. Will there be any steel plates left in the roadway? Uh, steel plates, you know, aren't allowed unless we're notified in advance for more than 24 hours in any one location. So I don't expect, you know, any major uh, steel plates being left on the road for any length of time, no more than 24 hours, and probably only once, if that. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, I'll move that we um, <coughs> approve the request of the uh, national grid to install and maintain approximately 470 feet, more or less, of two-inch gas main in Beale Street. This gas main will originate from the existing two-inch gas main in Beale Street at number 85 and continue under the paved surface of Beale Street to completion near 21 Weathervane Court. This gas main will be installed to provide a new gas service for number 100 Beale Street. And this approval is subject to the stipulation of the Department of Public Works as outlined in the letter dated March 22, 2018. Second. Is there discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. Barbara. Good luck on that. <coughs> Chairman, <coughs> make a suggestion? Sure. So the fire chief is here for what I anticipate being a, really, a fairly quick conversation. And then I think we have a bunch of residents uh, in the audience relating to the, the high school sailing team at the harbor, using the harbor. Okay. And um, they got to get home to do their homework, so. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Which would you recommend that we do? The fire chief. He'll, I don't, unless you guys think it's going to take long. Hi, chief. If you want to join us at the table. Sure. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, we have a new fire chief. I'd like to welcome uh, Fire Chief Stephen Murphy. Um, and, and in accordance with the um, uh, appointment and promotion of uh, former Deputy Murphy to now Chief Murphy, um, we, we are uh, called upon to enter into an employment agreement with him. We've done that um, in, in the sense of we reached uh, a meeting of the minds with respect to the employment agreement. So at this point, we are going to, um, unless my colleague has any questions on that, Nope. Um, <coughs> vote that contract. So I would uh, move that we sign the employment agreement with uh, Fire Chief Stephen Murphy. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Chief. Thanks for being here. Welcome aboard. All right, let's talk about the rowing issue. That's in the back of your packets. Okay. Is there anybody here? Okay. Well, <coughs> Tom, why don't, you, why don't you take us yep. through what we're doing here? So the Hingham High School rowing team is, is asking if they can utilize portions of the town beach to store temporarily their sailing boats for their practices. Uh, they want to do so directly adjacent to the town pier. Uh, and this is a, uh, is a, a beach that is controlled. This is a beach, a, a beach that is controlled by the board as acting as the Board of Park Commissioners. So this, is, this requires a vote of the board to allow this use. Okay. And, and this is a temporary, we're anticipating this taking, you know, being in place for no more than four weeks or so. Okay. And that's on the outside. All right. So that the, uh, the team can... Um, can get in the water. Get They're in already the water. about a week behind. Okay. Any questions on that? Um, yeah, so the, the, you'll store the, who's, is somebody here from sailing? Uh, looks like there's a bunch of people. I don't know if the athletic director might be in the, in the room. Join us at the table if you'd like. 
you could just identify yourselves for the record, please. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you personally. Sure. My name is Jim Quachmani. I'm the director of athletics at Hingham High School. Pleased to meet you. My name is Joe Goldman, head coach of the Salem team. Nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you, nice Mr. Meet you. Um, yeah, so I just um, was wondering about the storage of the boats there and the security of the storage at the beach. So there's, regarding the security, I was informed by the harbor master that uh, there's a camera on the telephone pole right next to the um, boat ramp. Okay. And there's 24-hour access, I guess, by the police and by the harbor master. Okay, to keep an eye on the boats. Okay. Yes, and usually, and usually there's police sitting in that parking lot at night and on weekends. Okay, and um, uh, you, I think you told me yes. we were going to talk to our conservation folks about yeah. uh, the use of that parcel for this purpose, and yeah. we're all we're all good on that front. Yeah, and all the. And <laughs> And all of the uh, regulatory boards on the second floor. It's been discussed. Um, this is this is a um, this is a use that is in that is consistent with uh, with your authority, and um, nobody had a problem with this moving forward. Again, okay. this is a temporary use. This is trying to get the kids in the water, uh, and uh, and not a long term solution, at least not yet. Okay. And um, tidal activity there will that affect affect the the launch timing or how, how no, it shouldn't. We, uh, we should have enough water as long as it's a couple, about 30 minutes after dead low tide. Okay. We have dollies and we can lift them with four kids or so into the water as well. Okay. Okay. So there's no issues there. Okay. Well, listen, I'm all for you getting out on the water. Um, I, you know, I, I think you got plenty of parking here. Um, you get direct water access. Um, you know, second okay. floor folks seem to yep. feel like it's okay. So. Yep. And the harbor master has been involved. Okay, thank you. I don't have any more questions. I see that the harbor master is in the audience unless he wishes to speak. I think I'd be inclined to just vote this. I'm I'm good to go. Yeah. I would um I was uh, briefed on this, and I would just thank the sailing team for your understanding. This past winter has been so difficult, and. Um, it's it's just kind of throwing a monkey wrench in things and we know that it's a short season and you want to get out on the water quickly and we know that um, this this solution isn't ideal for you um, I see a very high pair of boots in the front row so <laughs> wear those when you wade into the water um, but we we appreciate your understanding a, a difficult situation thank you so um, would you accept a motion all right, I move that the Board of Selectmen acting as the Board of Park Commissioners approve the temporary location of storage racks for the Hingham High School sailing team at Hingham Harbor in the, lo in the location shown in the aerial, aerial plan submitted to the Board on April 3, 2018 for the period ending on May 31, 2018. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All, right. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. Go get them. Thank you, sailors. Go Navy. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I have a lip. Waiting Street. There. Okay. The one other thing is, I don't know if anyone's here for the liquor license or not. We did the employment agreement. Okay. And, and the street opening. Okay. So the uh, the next item on the agenda is the discussion of a Chapter 40B local initiative program project being proposed by Habitat for Humanity at 302 and 304 Whiting Street. Is there anyone here representing? Hi there, welcome. Hi. Have a seat. Team. Could you please introduce everybody? Absolutely. Thanks. I'm Martine Taylor. I'm the executive director for South Shore Habitat for Humanity. I have Dick McGowan, who is our director of operations and um, Gary James, who is our engineer on this project. Wait. Welcome to everybody. Thank you very much. Doing, man. So, um, uh, Martin, could you please uh, just give us an overview of, of uh, what brings you here tonight and the, the specific request of the board? Certainly. Um, the, Thank you. We are here seeking support, certainly from the board, in um, moving forward with a LIP application for a 40B development on Whiting Street. Um, known as 302-304 um, Whiting Street, um, that we were awarded this project from the Affordable Housing Trust through an RFP process, um, and now we are beginning the process to come and seek um, approvals from town boards. 
As outlined in the RFP and um, in accordance with the 2014 master plan that Hingham had produced, um, while Hingham has met their 10% affordability, we also know um, throughout the Commonwealth throughout the Commonwealth and in Hingham, there is still continues to be a shortage of affordable housing. And Hingham does here on the South Shore still have the second highest uh, rental uh, population and rents here in the town. So uh, putting that in, in layman's terms, about one in three people who are in rental housing are paying upwards of 50% of their annual income on housing, which is a cost burden um, to these folks. South Shore Habitat is a nonprofit organization and our mission is to deliver simple, decent and affordable housing in partnership with the community and the community members such that ultimately our homeowners would have their incomes less than 30% of their annual income um, allocated to, to affordable housing and to housing in general. Our homes are, protect per, are protected with deed riders, so while Habitat is increasing the production of affordable housing, we are also sustaining it, such that should a family move, we would then uh, find another affordable family to move in and occupy these homes. So we are creating sustainable housing. Uh, to date, Habitat's built 58 homes. Um, we've partnered with Hingham since 1995 and have already delivered three homes here, so I think our reputation and and what we deliver you are well aware of. Um, this would be our fourth project for you um, and obviously would increase um, with the three homes that we're asking to present. Um, and currently, just for reference, we are building and just about to start construction on a six-unit subdivision in Duxbury. So we're um, well aware of, of what we're able to do and, and how to do it. So tonight, we're here to, and what plan you have in front, is to build three single-family homes. We are proposing ranch style homes but we also have um, we typically match the neighborhood so we usually try to see what the footprint would allocate for us the largest footprint and then certainly we have adjusted over the years we have the ranch we have a cape we have a colonial and we have a split level and ultimately our goal is to really see what the community has in the neighborhood and match it um, uh, but we feel that this the plot plan that we have and the space that's there um, would warrant ranch style living and it would also give us the ability to if there is because we are a fair housing lender somebody does come and need reasonable accommodation for um, accessibility issues one floor living certainly would address that easier than than our two-story homes okay. um, questions from my colleagues um, I have a few um, Gary where's the Nickerson home on this 300 Whiting Street <clears throat> and where's where's the roadway that right yeah. you mean the roadway going back to Derby Brook okay so that's Derby Brook that's and Derby this, Brook. Is this is this is the existing driveway going up to the existing house so currently there is a house on that lot Derby Brook the streets on the right and there is one abutter to our left and there's an existing Cape that is on the property at present What's your distance uh, with this driveway? Uh, this is not a roadway, right? It is not. Uh, it's a driveway, right? It's a driveway. It's supposed to be a driveway, yes. And, and it doesn't in any way meet the specs of the planning board? No, no. There's no drainage structures of uh, any kind yeah, on it? Yeah, they're going to be providing some drainage structures in the entrance. Into in where? There'll, there'll be some bleaching pits that'll be in the, into the front. What's the distance to Derby Brook? From, from this? From the driveway. About 150, 160 feet. And is this picture consistent with the sideline view that vehicle going out on a Whiting Street would have? Uh, pretty close, yeah, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. I think. Yeah, because that's, that's the entrance right there. That's the entrance going into Jerry Brook right there. Okay. Right. And that white vehicle is the driveway that you would propose to put in these additional dwellings? It's actually, it's actually on the other side of it. I okay. This is the entrance into 300 right here. Yeah. There's another entrance right here. Yeah. Yeah, so this, uh, okay. Yeah. And what's the distance to Derby Brook? About 150. And this is in a zone two? Uh, it's partially in a zone two. This, this line right here represents the limits of the zone two. 
And for the audience, what, what is the significance of the Zone 2? The Zone 2 is a designation of an area that is tributary to a well based on a certain, certain amount of, of uh, days where you have a drought condition and so that the watershed within the limits of that zone actually contributes to the well. There is an exception. The drinking water. Drinking water, yes. Okay. I'm not sure which one, although I have to admit uh, it's... And, and does the uh, other uh, houses abutting this property, are they fed by water, uh, by wells, or uh, There is one existing town well water. that is right here. Okay. Has any of this been vetted with the Board of Health? Pardon me? Has any of this been vetted with the Board of Health? Uh, to this point, no. No. You, were you first stop? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you are, you are our first stop. <clears throat> okay. Right. I'll hold on my questions for Karen? now. <clears throat> Listen, I um, I agree with you that, um, and and I think we've talked about it that, notwithstanding the fact that Hingham has um, has reached its 10% uh, affordable housing stock, uh, you know I think as a community it's important to be opportunistic um, with respect to uh, parcels that come along where we can provide, you know small uh, small scale um, and in this case I think family um, dwelling units um, in, in Hingham so I'm excited about the prospect of of continuing to do that and and this is one of those uh, I, I think opportunities um, you know I'll be honest with you the thing that I'm concerned about is um, the the number of structures that you propose for what I consider a pretty tight lot right it's acre ish little it's little over an acre so uh, you know, my, my, as my colleague suggested, I know that the Board of Health has um, sort of its jurisdiction over numbers of bedrooms, um, and you would have to work with them on, um, you know, uh, how many bedrooms you'd end up with. I guess I, I was understanding that our role was to um, give you a signal on how many structures um, we would support being placed on the parcel. Um, and that the other permitting boards would then move forward and do their jobs, right? So I, I think where I'm coming out, frankly, since this is, um, you know, I think what we what we often run into when we're trying to balance, um, uh, you know, market rate units with affordable units, you end up with margins that you've got to you got to meet. You know, um, I think one of the nice things about working with you all is that. Um, that concerns off the table. These are 100% affordable units, whatever we build there. Um, so, you know, I, I think from where I'm sitting, um, given, given the location of the aquifer, um, given the size of the lot, given what I understand um, the, the Board of Health general concerns are, also informs my thinking, I would lean toward two, frankly, two structures on that property um, and then have you move forward with the Board of Health to determine how many bedrooms you'd have um, in each of those structures. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm sure that's somewhat disappointing and I know that, um, you know, if that's the direction we go, it means, you know, one fewer, fam one fewer family has an opportunity for housing here. Um, but I do think it balances, um, again, the, uh, the stress on that particular lot in that particular location. So uh, that's, that's sort of where I'm leaning. And maybe we could get some clarity on, I know that we applied for, um, after the Affordable Housing Trust obviously did their due diligence. Um, I think that we originally years ago came back and there was one house there and originally it was going to be just renovate that particular lot and so I think this has been in the works for a long time about what the feasibility is. Um, I can't speak obviously to, to the conservation but from what I understand meeting the setbacks even though it's a it would be a comprehensive permit, um, my understanding is that this would fit. It does meet um, our standard homes are three bedrooms, one and a half bath. So we don't usually, you know, do a house with five bedrooms and, and limit it. So certainly the bedroom count, you know, could certainly change. Um, but I don't know if, um, you know, from if there was a re what would be the clarity as to why this wouldn't um, amount to three? Because, you know. Well, part of it is, is and 
maybe I can help a little bit. If you remember right, the, the reason why it's, it's low is <coughs> named 302304 is because there were two residents there were two. on okay. this right. locus at, at one point in time. Right. And the residence that was 304, or I'm sorry, that was 302, was actually removed in conjunction with Derby Brook. Now, this was always intended to be, when, when, when Derby Brook was originally approved, it was intended to be a safety law. So <coughs> look at the overall density that we were proposing and what came out of the Affordable Housing Trust. We looked at this, that it is the equivalent density of what would be experienced on, under a Residence A district within the limits of the town. In other words, you'd have one bed, one unit per 10,000 square feet. And that's, that's kind of how we, we looked at this in terms of uh, coming up with the density. We didn't think that the density was anything less than or greater than than what you would normally experience in the <coughs> town. So certainly, uh, that's how we came up with the three. Now, admittedly, Paul, we do have to propose, we do have to waive a lot of the subdivision issues. <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> because we do have to create frontage associated with it to be able to get the third law. So that's, you know, that, I will agree with you on that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, but the the, 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 <laughs> the, uh, the driveway entrance that we are proposing was always the driveway entrance to two units. To two units, right. yep. To two units. So, uh, and if you look at the <coughs> overall density, the important issue here is that we, when we look at the density and look at the overall loading associated with the with the septic systems, average L with Derby Brook. That's how I that's how I <coughs> looked at look at it as really one project. And when you look at Derby Brook, Derby Brook is on STU, so they they're on sewage treatment. So when you look at the overall loading, you know this falls in line with what would normally be considered acceptable by the Board of Health if you combine it with the, with the rear lot. Now, I understand this is, it is separated by the stream itself. It, I would just sort of maybe chime in here. I, I feel like we're, we're sort of push it, pushing the limits a little bit to get that third dwelling in. And I, I, I understand all the reasons why, why we might want to do that. Um, but it, it makes me a little bit uneasy, particularly kind of looking at, you know, looking at that driveway. I, I feel like... Uh, you know, if the parcel were a little bit bigger, three would sort of fit nicely. Um, and I'm I'm also trying to think about, um, you know, you talked about making sure that the homes and things like that kind of, you know, fit in with the neighborhood and things like that. I'm just trying to visualize three homes on that parcel, and I'm sort of asking myself whether whether that does, you know, whether that would sort of fit with the homes homes along Whiting Street. Um, it, it just feels to me like we're just trying to put a little more on that parcel than perhaps it could hold. Um, I'd, I'd feel more comfortable with two. Would you like to see a two-unit two, two, bed, two unit option? You know, the, you folks are the first applicant to come in on a lip since we've, you mm -hmm. know, met the temp set. Okay. Um, so, you know, I want to be thoughtful here because I, believe it or not, I'm very committed to affordable housing. I think that that's important that we continue to do that. Um, having said that, <clears throat> we we have a letter of concern, respectfully stated, by your neighbor, who you who you have obviously not spoken with uh, or know, um, outlining some concerns uh, about the density of the project right out of the gate. Um, I'm also concerned about the issue of collateral consequences too. So, um, you know you you're going to be looking for some substantial relief with respect to the construction of a roadway, I'm sure. It, you know, I, I'm hearing le leaching catch basins. So, I mean, I get what you want to do, but, you know, the, the more pressure you put on a driveway for what you're proposing, I think the more you've got to come into alignment with the planning board rules and regs with respect to the roadway construction, as well as the drainage. And, and that's not happening, um, I, I suspect. So you, you have to throttle back the density on site. And then we get to the Board of Health issue, which, you know, the, the Board of Health is ably capable of making that determination as to the number of bedrooms that you're going to need. Um, but, you know, clearly I, I'm in agreement with my colleagues that three is too much. Well, 
based on with all due respect yeah. to you. No, no, I understand. I understand. Yeah. But based on that, then why don't I present to you? I, I we did look back at up plan. Yeah, a little back up. All right, let's break it out. Uh, <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be a, a little happy over this one. Uh, let me. Uh, it's right. yeah. uh, sorry. No, that's all right. You're good. You're good. Thank you. Paula would remain, it would still utilize the existing uh, entrance for the common drive. You'd have a common drive for probably about 30 or 40 feet coming onto the parcel and then it would just bifurcate. You'd end up with two driveways going up to the two. They'd be side by side, pretty much uh, both facing the street too, so you wouldn't have anything perpendicular street. They'd both be parallel to the street. So it would, it would pretty much, you know, match the streetscape associated with the other residents that are to the south of, of this locus. And as you can see, too, there's, there's a lot less pressure further away from the, uh, from the well. Yeah. well. This is a concept, right? Yes. I mean, you're not asking us to endorse this plan no, no. in any way. No. Just, just the concept of the principle of two units. It's really up to support the letter of support the lip, under yeah. the LIP program. Just the LIP, yeah. And just to, be, just to clarify for everybody in the room, the, the uh, regulatory boards on the second floor here in Town Hall will be reviewing these plans and, and other plans and come up with a final design. So, so the ZBA would address the sufficiency of the proposal and the Board of Health would speak to the issues of... Um, how many bedrooms number, would number be appropriate for yep. the mm -hmm. uh, two units, correct? Yes. Correct. All right. Mm -hmm. So notwithstanding your description of three bedroom units, that's illustrative at best. No, the three bedrooms is, I think that's all that, that's, that's the only intent was, uh, was for two, three bedroom units, which is actually what was there before was two, three bedroom units. So you, you take down the existing. Yeah, we'd, we'd subdivide it into two, two separate lots so that each have individual ownership. Could you, could you build a three-bedroom house on a 16,617-square-foot lot? In residence B, it would have to be 20,000. No, I need, I need uh, some, some waivers from zoning. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why you've got 24 here and 16 there? created that way. What was the, the rationale for that? I just held a straight line. <laughs> That's all. Excuse me, but we can't hear back here. I'm sorry, I might like just speak to them. <clears throat> we can't hear anything. We really need to hear Sure, sure. I, I'm raising the question as to why one lot is 16,000 and the other is 24,000. And, and in this, what is this, what zone are we in here? We're in uh, residence C, so it's a 40,000 zone, okay. which is how the, the law was set up in the first place. It was set up as a, uh, it was set up so it would be in conformance with zoning at that point in time. So the lot is in conformance with zoning, and it, even though it was intended originally to be utilized by the town as a safety lot. And you need the lip relief in order to depart from that. That's right. Oh. That's right. Can you define what lip relief is, please? Sure. So the, the question is lip relief. To, Tom, so do you want to take that? The acronym stands for a local initiative plan. It's uh, commonly referred to as a 40, uh, uh, friendly 40B. Do we want, I, I know there may be some residents here who are interested in some of this. I'm wondering sure. if maybe we wanted to just, could yeah, I ask there. you to move the plan over there? And folks, if you, if you are interested in just coming up and taking a look at the plan while we're having discussion, um, I, would, I, would invite, I would invite you to do that. Um, we'll open this up to questions and comments from the audience in just a moment, but that may, that may give you a little bit better picture. Have to give this so wow, we have a lot of we have a lot of people here for this. So, um, Tom, let me let me just ask a, a question. Could I um could I ask everybody? I 
I, I was um, I was not aware that there would be so many people who are interested in this and I, I might just make a procedural suggestion Tom yep and that is that that these folks who you've all come here your neighbors your abutters you have an interest in this I'm wondering if it would be possible for this board to um, not take any action this evening but to give these folks the opportunity to look at these plans to ask any questions send any correspondence to the board I'm, I'm just getting the sense that I appreciate that you have these plans but I, I want to give these folks the opportunity to understand this and I just I don't feel like we're going to do that tonight so I, I, I really appreciate that you came in with two options um, it's really helpful to see it I appreciate that you're hearing some of the concerns um, from a timing standpoint Tom when yeah, when might we want to try to take this up so it's I would imagine that we would not do this at town meeting <laughs> correct <laughs> the <night of> town <laughs> meeting. so I believe we're probably looking at the May 1st meeting and and would that if if we took this up again on May 1st would that would that jeopardize <coughs> timing for you folks I don't, think okay. I don't think so. And I'm, I'm sort of looking in the back to the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust, Tim White, because I'm, I'm just trying to think about timing and schedule. Tim? Only in respect, uh, Tim White. Thank you. 35 Kimmel Beach Road. Um, only in respect to the requirements that they have to meet under the purchase and sales agreement, which the Affordable Housing Trust would obviously be willing to work with them. I, I think as you can see here, we have I think a number of folks who have an interest in this and these folks all came to our meeting okay so we we, we know what their concerns are okay and well, okay they were all invited to our okay. meeting and so, I recognize several sure of them. sure so I um, I think I'm getting a sense right now that are that there are still some unanswered questions and I think it would be to all our collective advantage to, to try to to try to do that um, what what I might suggest and and folks um, I think our affordable housing trust really they they go out of their way to try to notify people make people aware so I would ask that um, uh, maybe what we do is Tom we mm -hmm. we take these plans we have them available but I would ask that within the next two weeks questions and concerns be raised any any sort of thoughts you have to be directed to the affordable housing trust so that when we take this back up again on May 1st, we would need to make a decision. Well, I guess I'd say the Affordable Housing Trust and us, so that we can all yes. work, yes. so that we can Copy. all work together, sure. to get the questions answered. Yes, uh, because I we're going to have to vote on it. Right? Sure. Yes. And for the benefit of Habitat, usually as the process you know goes through, it's different under a LIP program than it is build by right. Um, we usually do hold an abutters meeting once we, right now, we're in the preliminary discussions of what we're building, and then we invite the town, um, and we usually do hold public meetings to do that once it's moved. So just for your benefit, I want to make sure you know we're hearing it as well um, to, to do that. So yep. we come to the community, and we want the community part of it. So. Um, it isn't just that we want to come and put three units here we want to meet the needs of the town um, and then needs of the future families who will live there as well is there a way Tom that the that these plans can be scanned so that mm -hmm. we could yep. we could make I, them available I was just gonna, I was online just make a recommendation okay. if, if you want I can I'll email Tom uh, a PDF mm -hmm. of these thank you plans yep okay so that he has them so if these people would give Tom their email then he can fall with the PDFs along so, so what, what I would suggest we do Mary is what we usually do is we'll take these plans we'll post them to the website along with the link to um, to probably Sally Sinclair's uh, email address so that all questions can be gathered and, and distributed to the board uh, accordingly okay and I think we again we want to make sure that the affordable housing trust that that questions etc that any any correspondence is received by by That's both right. our both our collective boards if Tim if that works for you that'd be great yeah and um, what what I'm going to suggest and what we often do with public feedback is we sort of set a cutoff so that we can aggregate and have discussion and things and I would I would ask that we do that within two weeks from tonight which is a April 17th and and then that way we've got some time to have any conversation and we can take this back up again on the first right. Tim, will the Affordable Housing Trust meet between now and then? We do. Okay. 
Gary, I want a full size one, please. Yeah. So April, so, April 25th. Okay, so April 25th. So let's let's maybe have all this in on the 17th because then as your group meets, okay. that, that you'll have the opportunity to have that. And if it's on the agenda, again, folks, I would really invite you to, to come in. I think the earlier that we all are talking about these projects together, um, just, you know, it, it works so much better for everybody if, if again, that works for you. Yes. And, sir, did you have a question? Sorry, could you, thing, yep, uh, could you give your name, please? Yes, Dave Nickerson, 300 Whiting Street. I'm one of the abutters right yep. next door. Um, I'd love to give my opinion out. The 17th is not going to work. I'm bringing the kids to Disney Friday. Coming back on the 18th, I don't know if there's any any well, with the that. You can just yeah. write it. You can give it to us in writing before then. Okay. So we have we have your correspondence already. So I, I didn't have a plan B tonight. I just had my own plan. So um, hopefully we can get copies of these and so, I'll be so able to we're not going like that on vacation. Right. Yeah. What, but, um, so the 17th is a deadline for us to get feedback from the public. Okay. It won't be on a meeting that night. Okay. So what we're talking about is we're going to post these plans that you're seeing here tonight to the website. Okay. So you can go onto the website, take a look at those plans, download them if you want to, review them, send comments to the email that will be connected to that to those plans, and then we have them. We'll distribute them up through. We'll collect them through the 17th. We'll distribute them to the board of selectmen and to the housing trust members, and then um, at the sounds like on the 25th at their meeting they might take this up. Yep, and then at our meeting on, on May, May 1st. 1st, it will be taken up again. Okay. So right. the sooner that we get Thank your you. questions and your concerns, the, the better able all of the town boards are to work together to respond to them, to factor them in. So the sooner the better. We will. And um, we, we appreciate you all coming out tonight uh, to, uh, to, to listen to this discussion. Tim, did you have anything else to add? Okay, Th and thank you, and Nancy, thank you for being here. So we'll take this back up again on the first. Again, thank you for both sets of plans, and you know, thank you for the great partnership. As Karen said, when we achieved our 40B safe harbor status, our view was um, basically that allows us to continue to move forward, but doing it on some of our own terms. For example, the local preference that you've identified here. Mm -hmm. And so we think that you know, partnerships like, like this one are going to be a good way to um, provide additional affordable housing in Hingham uh, that potentially our, our Hingham residents have greater access to. So we really do look forward to the partnership. And certainly for questions that are addressed, there will be questions engineering and town questions, but there are often questions about who Habitat is, what we do, how we do it, um, and who lives there, and who are our neighbors, and things like that. So I, you know, if those concerns are part of that, as long as yeah. we're on the list, so um, that we can effectively um, answer Respond that as well. Those. Yep, terrific. Yep. Okay. So I think we're going to conclude discussion of this matter tonight. Thank you again PDF very much matter. for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll give you both sets. I'll give you the three. I'm on the website, the town administrator. Um, we have a uh, we have a one day uh, before our, our yes. okay. I just I just want so. a full size plan of what you're okay. going to submit, what you're going with. I'll just take one of those. Just take. Okay. okay. Thanks, Gary. So we have uh, uh, <laughs> one. Uh, one other matter, I'll make a motion to approve the <coughs> issuance of a special one-day all-alcoholic beverages license to Denise St. Mary on behalf of Hingham Education Foundation for the Hingham Education Foundation annual fundraiser to be held at the Hingham Heritage Museum on Friday, April 6, 2018 from 7.30 to 11 p.m. Second. Any further discussion? Good. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, water company acquisition feasibility update. Um, before I turn it over to Tom Mayo, who's going to kind of set, uh, who's going to kind of set up the conversation, I thought it might be a good idea to just provide a little bit of context because um, Hingham has been talking about the possi the feasibility of purchasing the water company for about six years, and we also know that. A lot of people have moved into Hingham since that time, and a lot of people on policy boards have changed. So uh, just as a little bit of context, um, Hingham first began thinking about the possibility of acquiring the water company in 2012, 
And the situation at that time was that our water rates were the fifth highest in the state. Uh, after a 21% rate increase in 2009, the water company was requesting a 19% rate increase. We had received a, a large number of citizen complaints from uh, service interruptions due to repeated water main breaks. Unaccounted for water was 16% against a state standard of 10. And we were also told by, by one of the officials at the water company at that point, as we talked about capital, that the capital budget, quote, is determined by a formula related to investment return, depreciation, and an appetite for rate increases in <coughs> service areas. And that really kind of got the town thinking about the long-term benefits of owning and operating its water company. As the then Board of Selectmen took a look around Massachusetts, they discovered that Hingham was one of the few communities that actually had a privately owned water company and that many of those that those many of those served more than one community. So the fact that Hingham's water company serviced Hingham Hull and 300 homes in Cohasset, um, there were other communities like that. The town initiated a feasibility study in response to some of these different circumstances and the 2012 annual town meeting appropriated funding to study the feasibility of town ownership of the water company which is the town's right under a statute that, that was created in 1879. At that time, uh, the town formed a water company acquisition study committee. It was made up of four former chairs of the advisory committee and the then chair of the sewer commission. And that group was charged with providing perspective and recommendations in three areas, finance, governance, <coughs> and engineering. In 2012, towards the end of the year, Aquarian announced that the purchase price for the water company would be $184 million. In 2013, the Water Acquisition Study Committee completed its financial analysis that suggested the purchase price would be lower. The Board of Selectmen in 2013 voted to begin litigation to obtain a purchase price. And at that time in 2013, the Board of Selectmen at that time decided that it would be best to pause the engineering and governance work until we knew that there was a viable purchase price. Um, the case went to trial in 2015 in the Suffolk County Business Litigation Court. A ruling was issued in 2015. In 2016, uh, town meeting authorized funding to complete litigation. And the Business Litigation Court valued the system as of December 31st, 2013 at a little bit over $88 million. Um, both Hingham and Aquarian appealed that decision. And in 2017, the Appeals Court heard the case and affirmed the Business Litigation Court ruling. Uh, last December, as some of you may know, Hingham petitioned the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court for further appellate review. And last Thursday night at about 6 o'clock, we received notification from the SJC that they declined to hear the case, which effectively concludes the litigation. So we're here tonight, five days after that ruling, because we made a commitment, the then Board of Selectmen made a commitment to the town that when the litigation was concluded, information could be shared with the town. And that's what we're going to start doing tonight. We're going to follow through on that commitment and we see this as the first of several discussions to share information and engage the public. The question of whether or not to purchase the water company ultimately resides with the residents of Hingham. Our job as the Board of Selectmen is to share the information that has informed some of our decisions and to begin a public discussion. Um, we've spent a lot of time and effort on this and we want to make sure that it, that it is given uh, due consideration. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Tom's going to kind of frame the discussion. Again, this will be the first in a series of discussions. We're going to talk tonight quite a bit about some of the financial pieces. Um, but again, this will be the first of, of what we see as, as several discussions. Tom? Sure. Thank you, Mary. So we've tried to compartmentalize some of the information we have to date and, uh, and identify what we know, what we think we know, and frankly, what we don't know yet. So what we know, we know the purchase price as of December 31st, 2013. We also know that the water treatment plant is considered to be part of the system. 
operated we know the operating costs and what that would be under town ownership and we know what the rate payers have saved since 2012 what we think we know the town purchase price as of December 31st 2017 four years rolled forward we have reached out to our town council who I understand is working with Aquarians uh, town or Aquarians Council to determine a, um, a December 31st 2017 purchase price and we hope to have that by the end of the week we think we know what the town borrowing interest rates would be we also think we know what the impact on the town's AAA rating would be would look like we think we know the amount of the timing the amount and timing of the potential rate increase per the DPU current DPU hearings what we don't know yet the impact of, the, of a proposed capital surcharge and engineering and governance uh, related issues so there's a kind of a layout of you know what we're comfortable with what we need some more work on and uh, and where and where we need to go from here Mary I would recommend at this point that we invite John Asher and Ed Siegfried to join us um, I think most residents would recognize John and Ed as originally getting their um, their involvement in this issue with the water company acquisition study committee that was a group that was formed by town meeting several years ago um, more recently Ed and John have been working on behalf of myself and my predecessor to uh, to do some additional research uh, into things related to the financial uh, component of this discussion so if Ed and John wanted to join us Good evening. evening. Greetings. Greetings. Salutations. Good evening, gentlemen. I'll introduce myself. Ed Siegfried, 21 Camelot Drive, and a, member, Oops, and a member of the Water Acquisition Study Committee. And John Asher, 5 Common Street, also a member of the Water Company Acquisition Study Committee. Um, I'd like to expand a bit on, um, if I might, on the history and also kind of speak a little bit about where we are currently. Um, but uh, before I do that, uh, when John and I were asked to uh, get involved in this a number of years ago, I think, I think at the time John and I were both juniors in, co in high school. <laughs> um, a bit younger than we are now. But um, seriously, um, when we were uh, asked to take on this assignment, we did it with uh, really no preconceived notion of where we were going to end up. Uh, we had no agenda. Our assignment was simply to look at the financial data, and we had no notion about where we would want this to end up, nor do we today have a notion of where we want this to end up, because the work is still ongoing. We're still doing it. So, John, I'm I want to speak for you, but I think I just did. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just add that um, the committee itself in its first meeting voted uh, principles of operation, which basically uh, embodied the statement that Ed made, that the committee itself approached its task with the objective of just following the data, mm -hmm. being neutral and um, analyzing that data and presenting it to the board and to the uh, public in general. Um, if I might, um, six years ago, John Asher and I, as members of the Water Acquisition Study Committee, were asked to do a job and to gather financial information, and this is what we did. We have gathered a great deal of financial information over the past six years and have put in hundreds of hours in order to be able to present you with this information. My hope is that you'll find it useful and helpful. In June, 2012, 70 months ago, when we first started this project to determine if it was financially feasible for the town to consider purchasing the water company, there was a significant amount of financial information that we could dig into. In 2011, Aquarian had filed for an 18% rate increase and the DPU approved a 10% increase to go into effect in 2012. We reviewed all of the 2012 DPU rate data and other information in great detail. 
We also had three meetings with Aquarian's representatives in late 2012, during which we compared financial data, reconciled the numbers, and obtained Aquarian's projected rate increases by year to 2022. The end result of this work over a six-month period in 2012 was that we identified approximately 6.7 million in Aquarian costs that could be eliminated annually if the water company was municipally owned. This was 6.7 million out of the 12 million the DPU had approved, or 56% of the total. Once we understood Aquarian's cost structure, we were quite certain that a town-owned water company could operate it less expensively. The only financial unknown at that time was the purchase price, mm -hmm. the acquisition price. After the Board of Selectmen voted in July 2013 to file with the court to determine the purchase price, John and I were asked by the town administrator to periodically provide financial analysis updates that resulted from events after the court filing. At the 2014 town meeting, we described the makeup of the 6.7 million in Aquarian costs that could be eliminated with town ownership. They were water treatment plant lease costs totaling 2.7 million, return on the rate base, which is essentially Aquarian profit of 1.6 million, depreciation of 850,000. Okay. That's up here. I yep. guess. Income town, I'm sorry. Income taxes of 600000 plus the elimination of other expenses, including rate case expenses, corporate overhead, shared office space, legal fees, customer satisfaction surveys, rent for facilities in other towns, water purchased for resale, all of which added to another $1 million in eliminated costs, bringing the total Aquarian expenses that would be eliminated to $6.7 million annually. After going through every detail, we concluded that the $6.7 million was a firm number, not a guesstimate. No labor reductions were included in the total. No water treatment costs or quality control costs were eliminated. What was eliminated were Aquarian expenses that an investor-owned water company was allowed to charge us for the water. We said at the 2014 town meeting that the eliminated charges combined with lower borrowing costs of the town could be used to fund the purchase price of the water company, plus invest five million in year one for capital improvements, which would address in part the unaccounted for water loss that Mary spoke about earlier, plus fund two million annually thereafter in capital for system improvements, Plus, it would be used to repay, and this is important, repay the town for all expenses incurred funding the litigation. All of this would be paid for through water rates, not by real estate taxes. Our taxes would not increase if the town decided to purchase the water company, ultimately. After funding all of this, there would still remain a substantial cost savings difference over a number of years between town and Aquarian ownership. So where are we now? Aquarian filed for a rate increase of approximately 13% with the DPU in April 2017, one year ago, which would bring their base revenue recovery number to approximately 13 million annually to take effect later in 2018. I say approximately 13 million because the DPU has not yet approved this rate increase and is not likely to do so until sometime later this year. However, in addition to the base increase, Aquarian in February 2018, a little over a month ago, but 11 months after filing the initial rate increase request, applied for a surcharge to be added to the rate increase. The surcharge is called a Water Reliability Improvement Mechanism, or RIM, W-R-I-M, for short. We do not yet know of the full rate impact of the surcharge to Hingham residents and are asking the DPU for more information from Aquarian. We believe the impact, if approved, 
could have a very substantial impact on the water bills we get from Aquarian over a long period of time. Here is what we do know. If Aquarian, if Aquarian gets approval for a base revenue rate of around $13 million later this year, we believe the 6.7 in costs that would be eliminated that I mentioned earlier would still be included in their rates. Perhaps the 6.7 million would be a little higher, perhaps a little lower, but not substantially different. The 13 million is before adding the rim surcharge. We also know that the town cost of operating the water company would be approximately 6 million to start, an increase about 1.3% annually, due in part to lower borrowing costs. Aquarian proposes to charge $13 million for water in Hingham, Hull, and Cohasset, not including the rim surcharge. <coughs> Town costs would be $6 million, or a difference of $7 million below what Aquarian will be charging. Essentially, the amount derived from the $6.7 million in cost elimination items mentioned previously. The $7 million, we believe, would be sufficient to fund the debt service for the purchase price and the debt service for $5 million in system improvements in year one and fund $2 million thereafter in annual capital improvements and repay the town for all costs incurred in the litigation. So to answer the question, is the cost difference between Aquarian ownership versus town ownership sufficient to fund the purchase price debt service? I believe the answer is yes. What we do not know, we do not know the exact amount of the final rate increase that will be approved by the DPU later this year, and that's important. Mm -hmm. We do not know the impact of the rim surcharge on our water bills, equally important. We do not know Aquarians slash Eversource's plan for future rate increases following Eversource's acquisition of Aquarian in November 2017. And again, we do not know the exact price of the system roll forward to a future date from the court's decision of $88.5 million from December 2013. And consequently, we are unable at this time to quantify the ultimate savings to the ratepayers in Hingham, Hull, and Cohasset over a 30-year period ending about 2049, I believe, right. under municipal ownership. Our expectation, however, is that we should be able to do this when the knowns, when the unknowns become known later this year. That's the end of my opening remarks. John, you want to? I'll just say um, that we not only looked at costs that would be eliminated were there to be town ownership, we actually looked at additional costs that might have to be added, and we did add we did. those costs as well. And still, as Ed has so aptly described, the, uh, the difference was significant between Aquarian ownership and potential town ownership. Um, questions from my colleagues? I know it's a lot of information. Yeah. <coughs> it's a lot of numbers. This is more your... Really Want marked. me to start? Um, Go ahead, Paul. Um, <coughs> gentlemen, am I correct that council is trying to reach a consensus on what the price would be today to purchase it? It's the stated price by the court plus any interest that would. Right. Yes. And assuming that there can be an agreement, fine. But if there can't be, what's the plan then? Do they go back to court? For uh, right, right now, uh, latest I understand, Paul, is that uh, the town special counsel has communicated with Aquarian's lead counsel, who has committed to getting the information that we need in order to roll forward the price to current time. So I, I think we're sticking with Plan Alpha here, just given that written communication back and forth. Correct. So $88.5 okay. million dollars would get rolled forward by four years. Right. So I think, you know, people, people have been talking about that the price will be well over, that the price will be over $100 million. I, I think based on 
based on based on our financial analysis that's right yes mm -hmm. and your conclusion is that rolling that forward and looking at the principle of the costs that would be eliminated would be sufficient to pay the debt service mm. which again I think an important thing to point out is that a principle that is underlying this is that this acquisition would be a hundred percent rate payer funded correct I know there's a lot of talk sometimes about all the different capital projects we have going on in the town but a, a, a principle that is foundational to this analysis is that the water rate bills that we would that all the rate payers would pay would be able to pay for the debt service because it would be less than the cost that would be eliminated under town ownership right now I'll, I'll add one point to that Mary um, the committee when it started its work and after the the initial financial analyses that Ed was able to accomplish uh, with the Quarian participation from August to October of 2012 the committee came out and basically determined that before it would as a body make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen that uh, a purchase price would have to be of the magnitude that if the town voted to acquire the water company the acquisition itself would not necessitate an immediate increase in the rates for the ratepayers now I, I can't speak for the committee that hasn't met and discussed that for years but uh, I would believe that that would still be the position where we to be answering that question now so not only does the math work as Ed described but the ratepayers would not see an instant increase in rates were the town to vote to acquire the water company and the the financial analysis completed by the town has rate increases of 10 percent every three years which six years ago is what mm -hmm. the then owners of the water company indicated so to the extent that let's say that the water rates increased by more than 10 percent every three years what, what does that do what does that do to the math significantly drives up the 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 difference between uh, continued aquarium ownership and municipal ownership if the rates and that's likely to be what the rim charge might do it's going to drive up that difference what what does the rim and if you could just restate what that water reliability <coughs> improvement mechanism is a surcharge capital improvements it's basically basically Paul, what um, yeah. what's described in the amendment to Aquarian's rate case now before the Department of Public Utilities is uh, an additional up to it an additional million dollars a year that would be part of the surcharge applied to ratepayers bills in order to accelerate the replacement of water mains meters valves that have reached the end of their useful life has that been done before by the water company not by a water company in Massachusetts and 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 that um, Th those kinds of capital improvements likely are built into the savings number that you discussed right because you said you said in your financial analysis we would immediately plug five million dollars back into the system yes. so you're saying rates would be what they are rates would remain mm -hmm. constant at the level they're, they're at but because of the investor cost reduction mm -hmm. we're able to afford capital improvement within the current rate structure rather than a surcharge on top of the current rate structure to to make those kinds of improvements correct that's correct <coughs> question what why wouldn't the um, the infrastructure repair costs be included within the rate increase they actually well as, as Ed said um, we need to know more about the mechanics of the proposed rim the way we understand it at this point is that there is there are capital improvements that are still uh, incorporated in the normal rate base and in any future rate case that would be presented to the DPU this additional up to a million dollar surcharge is over and above that so there's capital on both sides mm -hmm. as we understand the rim proposal just from a layperson perspective isn't this really just a way to conceal 
a significant rate increase by breaking it up into two component parts? I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to ascribe motives to this other than to say uh, to me, um, I think Aquarian has heard from the town really going back, as Mary said, to the selectmen's meeting of December 2011, that there was a desire to accelerate the improvement of the capital infrastructure. The, the question is, at what cost to ratepayers? <coughs> And that's where it really begins to rub. As Ed has described, there's a significant difference between Aquarian ownership costs for ratepayers and potential town ownership. And that difference is what would enable the town, were the town to vote to acquire the water company, to accelerate capital improvement in accordance with town meetings vote in April of 2012. Could you put the, um, Tom, could you put that chart back from the 2014 town meeting? So if you look at that $12 million, of, of the 5.3 that's remaining, there's money in there for capital. But if you, you know, if you look at that, you would see that there are a number of costs that under town ownership, so the town wouldn't pay rent to itself for the water treatment plant. The town wouldn't give $1.6 million in profit to shareholders. The town wouldn't have to pay taxes. And so the idea is that, that those savings could be used to both pay the debt service as well as accelerate capital. I think it's also worth pointing out that under town ownership, you're paying debt service. And our, our financing assumptions are how many years? <clears throat> the, uh, we've talked with, our, with the town's financial advisor on multiple occasions. Again, uh, with Ted for, and before Tom and with Tom as well, basically to get their input regarding first, uh, what would the impact be were the town meeting to vote to acquire the water company on the town's bond rating? And we're told that uh, A, the market is aware of that potential and B, that uh, because the funding for that borrowing would be from ratepayers, that it really doesn't impact the, uh, the capital improvements that are separate from that that the town has been considering. The acquisition of a utility, standard practice is that it would be a 30-year borrowing long term. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, we also, on, on that slide that, that Tom put up, we, we think we have a sense of some of the borrowing rates. Our, our AAA <coughs> bond rating gives us access to the capital markets um, and, and some of the most favorable rates. So what, what sort of an interest rate assumption do we, are, are we looking at in our, in our analysis? Oh, I got them right here. Oh, good. <laughs> One, would, you, would you? Okay. Yeah, you do it. <laughs> um, a long-term 30-year rate of 3.75%. Um, were there to be short-term borrowing, that borrowing would be at 2.25%. And for the annual capital, $2 million over 30 years, 3.25%. Okay. And we've, we've sort of that we've was those, test, tested that with our financial advisors to, you know, I, th I think there's always uncertainty with interest rates. That was updated two weeks ago? Yeah, what we were told at the time that that was a conservative estimate. Right. So we, even, even with likely interest rate increases, looking forward, the, these numbers are still right. s these still c conservative estimates of interest yes. rate costs. A again, um, <clears throat> as Ed so aptly stated, it, th this is something that we've validated, but it's time dependent, and so it would need to be revalidated right. depending upon mm -hmm. um, town deliberations, what the board decides. So this isn't a number that's good forever, you just want to be checking, but we've got enough um, confidence in the, the delta between Aquarian ownership and municipal ownership that even if interest rates were to increase, uh, it is still affordable from a town perspective. Thank you. What, what other questions do my colleagues so, have? So I guess, you know, um, in terms of the unknowns, the 
the ultimate rate increase that's granted by the DPU and whether or not and in what amount the DPU would add a, would approve a surcharge under the RIM program, mm -hmm. it strikes me that what, I, what I'm hearing from you, I guess, is that the, the current delta under a lower rate structure with no RIM, what I'm hearing from you still makes this project affordable. Mm -hmm. correct, and correct. so it, it strikes me that the unknowns only make that delta greater. Correct. And maybe Correct. you've said that. So, you know, I think that, um, I think I, you never like not knowing, but it strikes me that the, the stuff we don't know, with respect to those two elements anyway, would go in favor of s increased savings under municipal ownership. Is that Correct. fair? Yes. Okay. You, Karen, you, you said, and I just, I'd like to <coughs> comment on that. Uh, there were a lot of, I tossed out a lot of numbers, but the, the key metrics here are 13 million in Aquarian revenues going forward, 6 million in municipal operating costs. That delta now, 7 million, 6 million from the 13 million is the 7. That 7 million is there to fund all, all of that stuff. debt service yep. as well as the capital. Litigation costs, capital. You got it. Okay. So my, my water bill stays the same, but the, relatively, but, but the things that I'm buying with it change within that. And, and as John has said, it reminded me frequently, we need to say, we're not saying rates will never go up. Right, right, right. We're saying rates will go up less dramatically and more slowly. It also says that if, if you're <clears throat> taking $13 million and we're saying that Six million, six million is the cost of municipal ownership. That, that also says to me right now that in my water bill, less than half the money I'm paying in my water bill mm -hmm. is going back into Hingham to take care of my infrastructure. <coughs> that that half of it is going to pay shareholders and rent and other stuff that doesn't necessarily benefit the ratepayers in the system. That's correct. As, as well as to address the issue of the conservation of a very precious resource through, ideally, improvement of the capital infrastructure enough that we start reducing unaccounted for water, which uh, most recently is now at 19 percent against the 10 percent DEP standard in the state. That's over 200 million gallons a year, I believe, something close to 250 million gallons. A year in unaccounted for water. Question. Question. Um, in terms of the rate increase, <clears throat> is there an ability to prognosticate what the likely increase is going to be based on past requests versus how the DPU has received them? Or do you mean beyond the current rate case, Paul? Or uh, well, looking at the current rate case oh. and kind of going back in time when they asked for earlier rate increases mm. as opposed to what they got? Really not. I mean, we know what Aquarian has proposed factoring in at the direction of the DPU the savings achieved from the Tax Act 2017 reduction in the corporate tax rate from 35 percent to 21 percent. I don't think the DPU tells Aquarian, what the answer is going to be until after it's well. Why done is it 13 percent as opposed to 10 percent or or 8 percent? That's an Aquarian number, not a DPU number. Right, but what's the basis of that request? Is that do we have any insight as to that? It's in it's in the Aquarian's DPU filing and all the answers to interrogatories that have been presented by the towns. Hingham, Hall, as well as the Attorney General's office. One of the things that in the pending DP rate case, you've heard me refer to the file room. So there's, you know, in every DPU case, there's a file room and it contains all correspondence that the DPU's received. So it's requests for information, responses to requests, um, it's testimony from different parties, and okay. and uh, all that information is out there. But typically. John, correct me here, but I think with, with a number of rate cases, it has, it has to do with 
you know, over time, the cost of doing business increases. Hmm. And so, so the idea of a rate increase is to say to the DPU, our cost of doing business has increased. And then part of the rate hearing process is to hmm. demonstrate that and to say, you know, our, 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 our costs for operations have gone up, our costs of materials have gone up. I'm, I'm simplifying it a little bit. And uh, so it's, it's oftentimes kind of looking back to say, mm -hmm. from the time of the last increase, these costs have gone up. Right. Um, and, and, they're, and they're allowed a fair return to right. their shareholders, right? right. So part yes. of their cost of doing business, because right. they're investor-owned, is yes. right. this dividend rate. Return on the rate base. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. we wouldn't have. Well, that correct. will always be so as long as it's privately owned. Right. Correct. Yes. Correct. The, the, I think the one thing that we have to keep in mind, is, as Ed mentioned early on, is that, is that projected rate increases, and, and, and Aquarian gave those to us six years ago, and at that time, under different ownership, it was 10% every three years. We have to recognize there's a new owner now. So right. we don't, you know, I, th I think there's some uncertainty as to whether, whether that premise still holds or not. Um, so. Are the people that run the water company, are they ever source employees, or? Well, ultimately they are right there. I think they're still, Aquarian is still its own corporation, but they're owned by Eversource. So the, the, when the transaction occurred, the team that was running the water company has remained in place. I, so just, I, I want to kind of recap, so, because again, there's, we're getting a lot of different information here. So, so there are a couple headlines here. One is that um, as we, as we're looking at rolling forward this number while we're still waiting for confirmation, when we run it through our modeling, um, the ratepayers can afford it. The ratepayers can afford to buy the water company. If, if the uh, information that uh, is forthcoming from Aquarian, hopefully shortly, is anywhere near the, uh, the estimate provided by the town's expert I'd say yep. the answer well, so, is yes. And let, let's stop there for a second, because the ratepayers can afford it, but we're not asking any more of the ratepayer than Aquarian's asking of right. the ratepayer. It so can be ratepayer funded, I, perhaps, is a better, is, yeah. is a better. But, but right. ratepayer funded with, within the rate yep. that's currently being Correct. paid True. by the, so, so it's not like we're, it's not like under this model, we're saying, hey, you can afford to do this. Right. You're paying right. your bill. The question is, what are you, what are you getting for your bill? Correct. Well, in one scenario, guess what you're getting? You're getting taxes, rent, shareholder return, this $6.7 million of stuff. And in the municipal-owned scenario, you, you are getting a water company. Correct. So I guess I, I just want to be clear that yes. we're not, we're not – we're not forcing people to afford something Correct. outside their bill. Yes. I, changing, I, what that's a better, changing what they're paying yeah, for. Yeah, that's a better. Right. And it will not, a purchase would not result in a rate increase. Right. Correct. The and, right. and that it would be, I, I use the term sort of self-supporting, which again means that our financial analysis assumes yeah. that this is all 100% rate payer funded. Correct. So the capital that the, the, the borrowing for this would not be competing with funding for schools and fire right. stations or any yeah. or anything else. Okay, and and the analysis again. I'm just sort of looking at the headlines, but out of the rate base, the analysis says that under town ownership, 56% of the costs could be eliminated, and that mm -hmm. that those and that and that under town ownership, the dollars could be redeployed so that there could be greater investment in the infrastructure within the rate base, which would avoid surcharges, surcharges. or, or rate increases to, to fund it. To fund additional yep. capital, yeah. Um, I guess the only, the only other thing that I have struggled with, um, you know, that it, and that I understand we still have some uncertainty around our, sort of our, the engineering, the infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, and I think that Part of what this surcharge points out to me vividly is that we have that issue now. Like, yeah. that issue's on the table, um, and they're under new ownership coming to the table now to say, 
you know, guess what, ratepayers? In addition to paying your water rate, you need to you need to invest in this infrastructure. And here, and and so we're going to surcharge you on top of the water on top of your water rate to deal with that. So, I I, I guess from time to time, I've heard from folks t that have said. It's, uh, somehow the conversation goes in the direction of, well, the infrastructure belongs to Aquarian. That's going to be Aquarian's problem to fix. And mm -hmm. to me, the surcharge is saying, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> that's our problem. It's it's our problem as ratepayers. So, the 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 operation, whether the municipality owns it or Aquarian owns it, is a hundred percent funded by the ratepayers. Right. It, it's a key point, Karen. Uh, in terms of the infrastructure, I've. I've receive the same kinds of questions, which is, well, does the town know what it's buying? In other words, it's all underground and it's what kind of, what state is it in, in terms of needing repair? And I think we would all agree an aged system and capital <coughs> improvement ideally needs to be accelerated. The question really, and the ratepayers are going to pay either way. Yeah, the question yeah. becomes, are you going to pay with an uplift because of the other costs associated with uh, an investor-owned utility or at cost with a municipally-owned utility. Yep, that's a good point. Yeah. Sorry. Any? Uh, do we have any sense as to how many water companies are privately owned within the towns they operate in Commonwealth? I think it's less than 10 out of about 245 or so. But I don't have an exact number, Paul, but I'm it's a small, it's a small number. number. We used to have a map of that somewhere. I'm sure we can We had a it. map from town meeting yeah. a couple of years ago. <coughs> OK. Um, Eric, can I just clarify? Just, I just want to ask one clarifying question. Uh, your financial analysis, where did the data come from for that? Well, it came uh, primarily from two sources. It came from the DPU filings of 2011 rolled into 2012 stacks and stacks and stacks of paper relating to that rate increase that allowed us, neither John nor I went into this exercise really knowing very much about water except that it came out of the faucet. Um, Wash occasionally. In terms of rates and, uh, and all that. I'm not sure we still understand rates, but we, we know enough about the municipal costs, both of us being on the advisory committee for years, we, we know what municipal costs are. So we were able to go into that DPU data and say, this doesn't apply to a municipality. This, this doesn't, depreciation, we don't, dep we depreciate on a book basis our assets, not but we taxes. don't charge taxpayers for depreciation, if you follow what I'm saying. So DPU data number one, Aquarian data number two. So Aquarian data from two sources. Um, Aquarian committed to delivering financial information and did uh, on July 2nd of 2012 at town request and presented that to the town in Sanborn Auditorium on the 12th of July 2012, as well as the three meetings that Ed had with Aquarian's Director of Rates and Regulations and their then Vice President. So really three sources for the data. Yep. Thank you. Um, this may be a good time to uh, open up to the to the audience and um, uh, to the extent that there are questions or comments I we'd ask you to um, uh, wait to be recognized by the chair give your name and address I would ask that you please direct any questions or comments to the chair to the extent that we'll ask others to answer questions um, as as we've sort of said at the beginning here there are some questions that probably can be answered tonight and some that can't um, my hope is that any questions or comments relate to a lot of what we've talked about tonight um, I would also just uh, remind everybody that the sort of rules for that that we apply at town meeting apply as well um, so uh, with that is there anyone in the audience who has a question or wishes to make a comment Yes, sir. Could you come up to the microphone, please? Yes, my name is Russell Reeves. Does this microphone work? Yes, it is. Okay. My name is Russell Reeves. And I really respect what you guys done. And I only have two questions. The first question is, are you in the business 
and are you to recognized as statewide, countrywide, worldwide water acquisition specialist? Mr. Reese, could I ask you to direct your second question to the chair? I'll ask these guys to answer that, but if, yep. if you wouldn't mind, just, just kind of for process, that would be helpful. No. Thank you. <laughs> now, you, this whole presentation today started off with something that I thought, and perhaps you can tell me whether it's untrue or not. Started off untrue, I think, but I could be wrong. You said Hingham started this acquisition process in what, 2012? Correct. Okay. It appears that in 1958, a town meeting rejected the proposal to buy the water company. It appears in 1985, the Water Supply Committee appointed a town meeting made a negative recommendation, and it appears in 2009, the Hingham Municipal Light Plant uh, Commission, Camp Dresser and McKee, the premier eminent worldwide water acquisition specialist, to, for $20,000 to decide or help the light company decide whether or not they should buy that, and it was overwhelmingly no. Um, it also went on to say that at that time, in 2009, the net asset value was between 41, I mean, excuse me, 42 million and 72 million dollars. This is 2009, only a couple of years later you started this long process that has already gone three times before you another time. So you started it for the fourth time. Now, the premier eminent camp dresser said that if you bought the uh, Aquarian Water Company for $42 million, your water rates would have an increase of 41% in 2009 to finance a 30-year debt. Should the um, net replacement value be computed at $72 million. That report said that the water rate increases would be 57% to pay off the uh, value. One of the things that this committee has said we're not quite sure about and we'll look at later is going to cost an enormous amount of headache pain and money is the governance. According to Camp Dresser and McGee, uh, they, they explain that special legislation appears to be necessary. They said that they observed that state law would allow Hingham to incur a debt for the purchase of a water company to serve its own inhabitants, but not for the purpose of serving, serving customers in Hall and North Cohasset. A regional water department could be formed under the provisions of Mass Law 40N or directly through special legislation. Now, if you've got three towns, 40% of the water used is done by these other three towns, they're going to have an equal vote. And that's going to cause governance confusion and drive up the cost. Oh, let's see. Now it said, um, the largest um, single issue with Camp Dresser McKee was that the town has to and cannot raise taxes to pay for it. Therefore, the repeated statements about it has to be paid 100% through the ratepayers only needs to be said once or twice. It doesn't mean to be repeated time and time and time again. What you should say is, is that uh, the state law, and we got some lawyers up here, um, does not allow the town to increase the, their taxes to buy this property, and it has to go directly to the ratepayers. 
Now that is a summation of the Camp Dresser McGee report. I would beg this board to make that available to all citizens in this town on the web page so they can look at it. It took a friend of mine weeks to get it because the town has got it stamped as confidential. It was a big problem to get that report. And that report came out in 2009, three years later it's 2012. You start another venture that had already preceded you three times before that. The last question I'm going to ask, it was brought to my attention today and I have no idea what the answer is, but uh, Karen Johnson might have the answer. Because it was brought to me today that it appears there's a conflict of interest. Now, I don't know whether there is or is not. Ms. Johnson would know that, and I'm going to ask her through you. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to ask Ms. Johnson through you. Uh, <coughs> it has been brought to my attention that Eversource, the attorneys that Eversource uses, her husband works for that firm. The next question is, A, is that true, and is, if, is there any reason to be, to, for her to recuse herself? That's about it. That's okay. It. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to just uh, address a couple, of the, um, a couple of the different questions. One of the things that um, uh, uh, Mr. Reese is correct, the town has considered the possibility of owning and operating its water company several times in our history. I think as we looked back, we found maybe five different instances where it was contemplated at some point, but it was never brought to the point where a purchase price was determined. And I think if, if you remember from some of the town meeting conversations, one of the things that we talked about and, and that I think was one of the reasons the town meeting supported this effort a few t on a few different occasions was because we said this will get a purchase price with certainty that the town can carry into the future where some of these other efforts didn't. And so each time there was talk about possibly considering it, we sort of had to start, you know, start all over again. Um, with respect to the uh, with respect to the CDM study, that actually is not the that study was commissioned by Hingham Light, and it is not the town's property. It is the property of Hingham Light. It was an analysis that was completed, f uh, commissioned by Hingham Light. Um, we were never certain of a lot of the sources of information, but one thing that struck us about that about that particular analysis when when we viewed it was that it was it did not mention the statute of 1879 that drove the purchase of the water company um, there were also assumptions with respect to interest rates that that made the economics very difficult you know as you can imagine on a, on a purchase of something of this size the difference between a three and a half percent interest rate versus a five percent interest rate is substantial and uh, it, my recollection from that CDM study was that the interest rates it was using at the time uh, were, uh, were higher. quite high. Yeah. John, uh, just before I, I go to the next question, anything to add on that CDM study? Yes. Um, that issue, uh, Mr. Reeves, was raised back several years ago. And I don't remember whether it was in the fall of 2012 or sometime during 2013. but. Uh, we were made aware of the CDM study. I mean, I'd, I think I heard about it, but hadn't really investigated it. Uh, we met subsequently with CDM, who then issued a letter of clarification that I, I think is on our website. I'll, okay. I'll check that, but made the points, Mary, that you've made, that uh, because the light plant did not have the statutory authority that the town did, uh, that made acquisition I think it required the formation in the view of CDM of a water district, which required special legislation from the Commonwealth's legislature, not the case with the town, and definitely the case that the borrowing rate was significantly higher. Uh, but that, that was clarified in the letter that CDM delivered to the town administrator. As I say, I'm, 
I'm not sure if it was 2012 or 13, but we can find that out. And maybe we could also just check that if that is not on the website. We'll I, know, I know there's about 3,000 pages on there, but if it's not on there, um, maybe we could please make yep. sure that it is. Yep. Did, did you want to speak? Yeah, so actually, thanks for bringing, bringing that up, um, Mr. Rees, because I was wondering whether I should bring it up again tonight. <coughs> sure, I don't know what's going on with my microphone. So, um, so if you tune into these shows regularly, I seem to make a disclosure about something or another, you know, at least once a month. Um, so <laughs> with respect to Eversource, I actually did make an oral disclosure and filed a letter um, with the town clerk's office noting that um, it's actually uh, I work for Ropes and Gray, and Ropes and Gray represents Eversource. Um, I worked um, very diligently with the folks at Ropes and Gray to determine whether uh, uh, I had a conflict with respect to my work at Ropes, which I don't. I don't do that sort of work. Um, I have no uh, no contact with the teams that do, um, like we do for many other clients. There are ethical walls that the uh, law firm has put in place to make sure that that is in fact the case, um, both in practice and and legally. Uh, I consulted with town council. Um, because I, I take this very seriously. Uh, I consulted with town council, um, and we came to the conclusion that there was no conflict <coughs> under state law. And so, as I said, I filed that disclosure with the town clerk's office. Um, you know, it may be, given your question, it may be, since this is, is now ripe for discussion, may be important for me to just make that disclosure again. So I appreciate you bringing it up. Well, that, was this, I, that exactly was the same issue. Oh, so whether it's your husband or you, that's not relevant. And what was relevant is, is the disclosure, and you made it. Yeah. And what I would like to bring to this committee here also is that uh, $100 million is a lot of money. And the ratepayers are going to have to pay for it, whether you get uh, a three percent loan or a ten percent loan, or you have to put we, meaning the town has to put another fifty, sixty million dollars in the infrastructure. They have to pay for that, and they should know that up front. They should know up front that uh, the get the Camp Dresser McGee report that should be on the website. You, they should know. I shouldn't have to stand up here and tell you that in 1958, in 2009. Uh, the town tried to look at this and buy it, and you start off with, well, the first time we started doing this was 2012. That makes this board look like it's trying to hide something. Thank you. And it makes nobody feel good. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else with a I question? I just or want to comment. comment. Uh, Mr. Reeves, before you head off, this has been discussed publicly. This isn't like the first public explanation of the history of, you know, this issue. Um, with all due respect to you, I understand your perspective, but I disagree because I, I've heard this with my own ears at you know town meeting. I'm not saying that. I'm saying tonight. <coughs> with the way she started off tonight, I right. think it's I, obviously been uh, said in four different times, four different, three different town meetings. So I, I didn't say that. I said specifically tonight. The discussion as to whether to fund the litigation has always been preceded by, you know, the history of, of this issue before the town. And we've been very careful as we've gone along to, to lay it out there so that the public has a clear understanding of, of, of what's being tasked here. And, you know, this Camp Dresser McKee report has been discussed in the past. Um, and you can scroll through the meetings. Uh, you know, I, I realize that the, uh, the predicates of that report uh, lack the kind of um, foundation that was necessary for us to rely upon. Um, you know, I think Mr. Asher laid it out pretty well. So I believe you're, you're correct with that, but okay. people can't see that report and make that decision themselves. So please put it on the uh, web page. Thank you. Can I sit down now? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who uh, has a question or would like to make a comment this evening? I know we've gotten a lot of information. Yes, sir. Could you come up to the microphone, please? Thank you. 
Norman Fulton, 540 Main Street. I just wondered if there were any additional costs in selling it or transferring it that had not been worked in. I couldn't quite see oh. all the numbers from where I was sitting. And so, sir, like by legal costs or fees yeah. that are involved oh. in making the sale. Yeah. Do you want to maybe speak to the, um, there were, I believe there were some transaction costs as well as the concept of repaying the money that was used for the feasibility study? We built in some costs uh, associated with services that the town would provide that had been provided by acquiring customer service, and billing, and such. Uh, some one-time transaction costs. But I wouldn't sit and purport to say that we investigated the, the detail associated with packaging a financial transaction just because, as I think has been stated a, a number of times, uh, we wanted to do this in a phased way and spend as least of the town's money as possible. Getting the price that was the final price was really the key, as well as uh, resolution of whether or not the water treatment plant was indeed part of the system, which the court has ruled that it is. So I'd say, yes, I think we have some of those costs built in, um, but I think there's more to be learned there. Yeah. I, I would point out that the analysis does, um, does include repayment of the oh, million. And so yeah. town, there has funding, the authorized funding so far is a total of, of $1.5 million. And the financial model says the first thing that would happen if the town were to purchase it is the town would be repaid. And so in effect, if, if the service area would cover Hull and you know perhaps a couple of hundred homes in Cohasset, that would have the effect of those other communities sort of helping cover those costs so that those funds would be returned to Hingham. Correct. Excellent. You've done an amazing job. I can see an awful lot of work. Thank you very much for recognizing that, Mr. Fulton. Yeah. And the I final concur. thing I had was, if in fact this should go through, would it be possible to prepay on the principal without taking a penalty on the loan? Because it sounds like you're talking of the possibility of significant gain. Yeah, I'd say the answer to that is, is yes. We, we built in very straightforward borrowing, so prepaying wouldn't have a, a penalty, best, best we understand it. 30 years is a long time, and a lot can happen. True. Yep. Thank, yep. You. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Again, a lot, so we appreciate everybody being here tonight. There's There's been a lot of information that's conveyed, and as we've said, uh, we think that this is the first in kind of a series. Um, Mr. Rebuffo? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have uh, a couple of questions and comments, if I may. Bruce, can you just introduce yourself, if you wouldn't mind? Did I? We, we all know who, we know who you I... are, but members of the viewing audience may. Um... Thank you, Mary. Bruce Rebuffo, One Dwiggins Path. Um, first question, if I may. How much money have we saved since there were no rate increases since we filed? So those, those rate payer savings, John, you're nodding your head, so I'm. I, um, in anticipation of that question, I've updated the chart that we've pre previously used. Uh, to this point in time, since the uh, refinancing of the water treatment plant, that Aquarian accomplished about six months after the study was authorized by the town in April 2012. The, the net savings that ratepayers have enjoyed is now just a shade under $5.5 million. $5.5 .5 million. Correct. OK. I'd like to comment on a question that Mr. Reeves raised about governance and the comment of, concerning the um, equitability of management concerning the um, participation of Hull and Cohasset. Uh, early on in the discussion, when I was chairman, we convened a meeting with all of the towns potentially affected, 
and as you have done continually, is if there's a showstopper, as John calls them, we had a series of meetings with those towns to make sure <laughs> that they were with us all the way so that Hingham didn't pursue down a garden path thinking we could do something that would end up in court with, uh, with the other towns. So I think that should be emphasized as well. And if I recall correctly, and I think it's still true, those towns have been very supportive of, of this effort. So I, I think that should, be, that should be emphasized as well. And um, in terms of uh, some of the future issues, uh, I just would like history since we can talk about this now. We, I personally, and with other selectmen, and with John in presence, had a number of discussions with Aquarian during the course of these years. So we didn't start this process willy-nilly thinking where they're the bad guys and we're the good guys, mm -hmm. or the other way around. We started this process with an understanding, could we negotiate a price? Okay. And uh, the last piece of information, which nobody's mentioned, is Governor Long, in 1876, when he founded the water company, gave us the option to buy. And when the town of Hingham elected not to do that, uh, he made sure the price was accordingly reflective of that initial rejection. <laughs> so I, I think uh, politics does have its, uh, its a day in court. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Again, first in a, a series of discussions, our goal is to uh, as we said, it's important to this board that we follow through on the commitment that's been made to the citizens of Hingham, which was that when the litigation was concluded and information that couldn't be shared with the public prior to the litigation be, being concluded. So we, we want to kind of continue that process. We've, we've started down the path. John and Ed, you know, thank you not, not just for what was done tonight, but as you talked about the hundreds of hours of work, I, I think I think you're being pretty conservative on those assumptions, um, and I, I think that uh, as we look and you know we we think about all the tremendous work that volunteers in the town of Hingham do, um, the the number of volunteer hours that that you've contributed on this project um, has been considerable and and so appreciated, and um, we're just we're very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. Thank you very much. You know, so I, I think as Mary said, um, this is the opening conversation, and um, we obviously have a lot of work to do, and we'll we'll do the work. Um, we'll continue to do the work. We're in a, a different um, we're in a different mode now because we're not in litigation. So we're we'll be able to have I think more frequent conversations with you as as this work continues to unfold, but. You know, I, I think that's the mindset I'm in. I, I, I think that, you know, like the Water Acquisition Study Committee, um, we are data driven. And so that it's sort of that next set of data points that we need to continue to, to evaluate um, the feasibility of this and the advisability of this. And that's what we owe to the town, I think. And I, I would echo what, you know, Ed started in saying when, when you started this effort, no preconceived notions, no ideas. I'm kind of in the same place. Somebody asked me today, you know, what, what's your opinion on whether or not we should buy the water companies? I don't know yet. Right. Don't know yet. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. We have, uh, I think, the our, our final item of business, I believe, are selectmen and town administrator reports. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to let everyone know that the Selectmen's Cup will be held at the South Shore Country Club on May 14th. Um, the public is welcome. Contact the club or our office if you'd like a, if you'd like a foursome. The, also, I want everyone to know that the country club uh, executive director and the assistant town administrator positions are currently posted. Uh, we are accepting resumes and hope to be interviewing sometime within the next few weeks. And the last thing I want to let everyone know is that the warrant is in printing. Here's a draft. Ooh. Bright yellow this year. Shouldn't lose it. <coughs> um, it will be, and it will be in the mail early next week. The warrant will be. The re annual reports will be sent to the printer at the end of the week, so we should have them as well soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. Um, 
I, I think what the town saw tonight in uh, Mr. Asher and Mr. Siegfried was perhaps the, you know, the, a superb example of uh, the spirit of volunteerism. Um, you know, I've been involved in this litigation since inse its inception, and the assistance that's been provided to me uh, by those two gentlemen has been invaluable. Um, so, you know, I, the strength of our, our government in, <clears throat> in large part relies on the qualified people stepping forward and volunteering uh, to serve. Um, I think that that adds to the quality of, of life that we have come to enjoy. Um, speaking as to the, the paid employees, however, um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the, the work, the difficult work that the sewer department uh, engaged in today on Route 3A. There was a forced water main leak. Um, they were out on a major roadway uh, with the uh, contractor, D'Alessandro, uh, and, and worked hard to uh, get that fixed in as vast a manner as they possibly could. Um, you know, I know it's their job, but I, I appreciate that. And to those motorists uh, whose commute was impacted this morning, I'm sorry about that. You know, hopefully with the work that we're doing over in the shipyard, we'll take some of the pressure off that uh, that main so that this doesn't happen again. Um, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for that. Aaron? Nope, I'm all set. Um, <coughs> I just, uh, one thing, I, I actually had the um, honor this morning of uh, welcoming uh, seven, uh, seven men and women from Cape Town, South Africa here to Town Hall and giving them a tour of the building. Um, St. John's Parish uh, has some uh, parishes and communi faith communities in South Africa that they've developed a relationship with. So last year, a number of St. John parishioners went over to Cape Town. And this week, there are 17, 17 students and seven adult chaperones. And while the kids were in school today, we walked through town hall. And we talked about how Hingham's town government compared to South Africa. It was a delightful conversation. Um, we sent them on their way with annual reports and 4th of July parade buttons. Nice. So they will, uh, they, they've been told there's no test, but they're going to wear their buttons proudly. And uh, I will just say that the 4th of July parade buttons are out. And um, my, one of my first volunteer jobs for the town was that I was the button person for the parade <laughs> committee. Um, and I would just remind everybody that our 4th of July parade is 100% um, is fu privately funded. So those button sales and the Selectman's Cup and there are other opportunities. It's just such a, a wonderful tradition in Hingham. Uh, this year the theme is celebrating volunteerism, which just seems Perfect. apropos this year. Uh, so uh, look, look for those buttons to be out at, at different places. Um, our town clerk is selling them downstairs if anyone needs. Uh, so with that, our next meeting will be next Tuesday, April, April 10th. Um, we will be having a preview of the zoning articles, uh, among some other things. Uh, it's, we're sort of tentative on whether or not we will meet on the 17th or not before town meeting, kind of seeing what the, what the schedule looks like. Uh, so with that, I'd uh, take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night.